Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from across Canada. Our mission on this show is quite simple. Shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table that shape the communities that they call home. And joining us for today's episode is from the village of Andrew, Alberta, Councillor Merwin Haight. With their unique events, festivals, and community spirit, the village of Andrew welcomes you to visit them for the day, weekend, or perhaps consider moving to Andrew because it's country living at its best. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs and they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Councillor, thank you so much for sitting down with me and talking about yourself in the village of Andrew. Before we jump into the entire interview, I've got to start with the question I've always asked every single person who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Um, that goes back to a bit of a family thing. So my grandfather served in the military and great uncles, and I grew up around them. And so we had a sense of being involved in our community. And then in high school, uh, Mayor Frank McIntosh, Lieutenant Digby, actually had our law class come down there. And uh, I was actually got to sit as mayor for uh, a council meeting. And it was to teach us about government and uh, explain the service and how it, uh, municipal government works for your community. Did you always, did you ever think you'd ever be a politician or... Did the desire to become a politician spawn from that class? It, it spawned the interest in municipal politics. And um, my involvement over the years was involved with the planning advisory committee. Um, I was vice president for the Agricultural Society for a county. And it didn't really occur to me that I wanted to be an elected official until I moved to Andrew. And I was really quite encouraged by some of the local residents um, I said, you should run for office, It'd be some new ideas or fresh blood to the council. Was mom and dad uh, political? Pardon? Was mom and dad political? Did they have a political bone in them? Or are you the black sheep of the family and decide to get in politics yourself <laughs> outside of mom I and am, dad? I am the black sheep of the family. Uh, yeah, political involvement and, and stuff like that really jumped quite a few generations, but it's uh, kind of been in the family um, over a deck, you know, over generations actually. So, um, you know, the, one of the governors of California was a hate. Okay. A small family. So, uh, I have different cousins who have been involved directly with municipal politics uh, back home in digby county and in the town so digby county but, is in nova scotia correct correct okay <laughs> no, see i i know things i i pretend that i know things <laughs> <laughs> um so you moved to the village of andrew and then in 2021 from the records that i can see you decide to put your name on the ballot what made you finally say, okay, now is the time? Because you could have waited. You could have said, okay, maybe not this election, maybe four years from now I'm going to run. But what was going on in 2021 that gave you the optimism that you could do it that term? Was it just the encouragement from the community? The encouragement from the community, um, I honestly didn't expect to be elected. You know, I give myself maybe a 50-50 chance because I wasn't no one. I hadn't lived in the community very long. Um, but yeah, you know, some of the local residents here were 
you know, run for council. And, and at that point in time, I'm kind of in a transition in my life. So I had this spare time, so to speak. And I said, sure, sure why not? How bad can oh. it be? Okay, we're going to get into that comment in about two seconds. But I want to stick on that last thing that you just dropped. You, you you didn't expect to win. Now, you were the second person to tell me that on this show, that they ran not expecting to win. Why do it then? Why put your name on the ballot when you internally think you're not going to win? Well, you're reaching out to the community. So one thing is, okay, how receptive is the community to newcomers? That's part of it. And, you know, it opens often when you run your name and, and whether you win or not, and even though not expect it opens the doors to meet other people and then you actually see what kind of involvement you can get into your with your community you are mm -hmm. so you you get elected in 2021 and the people of andrew have put their faith into you in that election uh, I, I looked at the results and you, I think you were one of the middle of the pack people who got the most votes in the, the election. What was that moment like when they told you or you were notified that you would be the next counselor for the village of Andrew? Was there a sense of, oh my God, what did I get myself into? Or was there a sense of, okay, now, now the real work begins? More of a, a combination of the two. Because uh, the first thought was, oh, wow, I got elected. And, you know, and it's now the real work begins. And that's, that was the, um, uh, the real eye opener for me is that, you know, this is, this is real. And this is a very serious job. And was it what you expected looking back on it? Because we are now three years into your first term, looking back on from when you were first elected to even before you were elected to now, do you, did you think that this would be what life of uh, a municipal politician would be like? No, it, it, it is much, much more challenging. And, you know, being an elected official in smaller communities has its, its own unique challenges, but, the fact that when most people, including myself, when you become elected, you've never read the MGA Act. You believe that, hey, I'm going to go in there and, you know what, my constituents want this street paved and we're going to get it paved. Um, doesn't work that way. Or we're going to get this done and that done. What I come to realize is we work within the, what's called the speed of government. And there's a reason we have these checks and balances. Uh, and that's something that most people, uh, including myself, we were just, uh, myself, I will say, uh, kind of ignorant to making how fast things can move or how slow they move. And there's, okay. uh, do you think the average resident, and I say average, do you think the residents of Andrew know the speed of municipal politics? Because I can imagine you're not alone in that statement that you don't realize this you're you're sort of bound within that speed of government mentality do you get a sense that people understand that there is only a certain amount that you can do as a counselor so therefore you can't just snap your fingers and everything's going to be fixed tomorrow morning yeah i think there's a lot of people who don't understand it a lot of our residents don't and it leads to frustration and a big part of that um, falls back on administration and counselors. And that's a combination there of being able to relay and communicate why things take so long or what the checks and balances are and not hiding behind uh, VoIP, can't tell you. Um, no, it, it's um, come to the next council meeting and maybe we'll have an answer because we're waiting themselves that communication within small communities is often not clear enough or blunt enough. And when I say blunt is don't sugar, don't, don't coat it up. Oh, this or that be blunt. This is going to take six months. This has to go into budget. No, we need to have it. We're applying for a grant. We don't know if we're going to get it, when it will be. Yes, we can do this, but this is the effects it's going to have on your services. You know, you, a great example comes in a small community. So, oh, we want a splash park. Well, where do you take that money from? 
account. So you have to, that is something that people don't understand. We're balancing out and it takes time to do all this and the costs. So, and weighing that cost so is really important in, in that time, slow time procedure, taking that time. Okay, so there's two things I want to pick up on there, but I want to start with this one because in a smaller community, communication is key. It is probably one of the most most prominent things that a municipal politician has to do. The issue, though, with that and the double-edged sword is in a small town, you have to be blunt, not just to one person like a larger city. You have to be blunt with every single person because they are your neighbors. They are your friends. They are your family members. They are people that you go to the grocery stores. They are the people that you your kids play hockey with. How hard is it to communicate in a blunt manner while knowing that you know everyone in your community. And I say that respectfully because in the the size of Andrew, you literally probably know 98% of the people who live there. And therefore, you know how it's going to affect every single person that you're, the motions that you're voting on. Well, I had a little bit of advantage. So moving to Andrew, I was so a full-time resident here but a year and a half prior to being elected. So I didn't know everybody in the village. More people knew of me than I knew of them. So <laughs> is, Isn't that I always the case no... with a smaller community? Everyone knows when there's someone new who moves into the community. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I hadn't established all the relationships to know who's related to who, who's friends, who's intermarried, who works for who. So for me, it was an advantage because everybody was just equal. Yeah. Um, and I had nothing to nothing to hide. It's important that, that communication, when I say blunt, it's not candy coated. Yes, we can do this, but it's going to cost. And yes, we need to have engineers. Yes, we have to look at our costs, contractors, et cetera. Those are the biggest things that come up in small towns. I want my street paved. I want my sidewalk fixed. I want my neighbor's dog to stop barking. <laughs> and, and, and these are little things that all take time. But that communication being blunt, um, really with no relatives here, no family here, no former ties to anyone here, um, it actually made it easier. So in, in your opinion, what do you think is harder from the role of a counselor? Is it harder to be blunt with people who you're going to disappoint or is it harder to be blunt with people that you're going to have to talk to who don't agree with you? Because people who agree with you and are upset with your decisions, you're going to have to have the same conversation with them than the ones who don't agree with you. So in from your perspective, how, how is it easier to talk to the people who do agree with you who are upset with you or the ones who don't agree with you and are upset with you? I'd say the ones that don't agree. Um, and the reason why I say the ones that don't agree with me, because it's part of my character, whatever research and debate things out. You know, I find um, it's just easier to speak with ones who don't agree with me. If they're not in a hostile manner, you actually want to get the two sides because I want to learn and know what their 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 paradigm is on on it on that subject or that item, so I can understand why they're disagreeing with it or why they don't like it. And a lot of times, you get a much better exchange of information in those situations. I like that. I, I truly do like that. Um, before we turn to the village of Andrew as a whole, I have one last question about the role of council. Um, what's one piece of advice that you wish you would have known prior to entering into municipal politics that you would hope the next generation of municipal leaders takes and runs with before the next election in Alberta, which is scheduled for, as of recording, less than a year away. Get involved. Go to the council meetings. Be, be involved in the council meetings. Go and see how your municipality runs. If, if you're considering 
uh, to run as an elected official, uh, get in there. Yeah. Start seeing what's going on. The other advice I'd say to give to anyone uh, who wants to know more about their how their municipal government works or, or you know, within our village here, we'll narrow it down. Be involved in committees. Uh, come in and volunteer. If there's, a, if there's an opening on a public committee, put your name in. Um, it kind of gives you that engagement that you won't get from sitting home on the sidelines and uh, reading, you know, the Lamont Leader, you know, uh, titles that comes up, you know. Oh, and we're cutting this out because I hear a phone call coming in. <laughs> I apologize. Um, a little bit of banjo music. <laughs> there you go. Just jumping on that, and I was not going to ask this question, but I think it's an important one. You talk about engagement. How is the engagement within the village of Andrew? And, I, and I'm and i going to preface this question by saying this. When I speak to municipal leaders, apathy is a big concern to a lot of municipalities right now where the volunteer base is drying up and people are not stepping up to fill those board positions, those volunteer positions. In Andrew, do you get a sense that people are actually engaged and want to make the community better? That's a double edge. That's, that's one you got to weigh out. So if there's a hot topic, yeah, people will be engaged. So when we uh, apply for municipal inspection, you know, that had a lot of people engaged. But as soon as the excitement dies down, then your council meetings are down to the last you know, three or four people that show up every meeting. The other Wait, population... whoa, 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 whoa. You actually have people who regularly attend your council meetings? We have people who regularly attend. Good on, good on Andrew. Good on Andrew. Because you know what? I am not hearing that a lot anymore when I do these interviews. So whoever those who are attending those meetings... Good on you for being involved. There's my little plug there for the people of Andrew. Anyway, continue on. <laughs> well, you know, one of our one of our residents who is a regular attendee, um, she has been in the community you know, all her life. She actually holds our feet to the fire, you know, and she has very smart and intelligent questions. And she's probably one of the most informed residents because she attends council meetings and she wants to see the minutes and she wants to see the motions. Um, would love to see her, you know, people like that increase in the number, but you're right. There is an apathy within the smart, within politics, uh, whether it's municipal or provincial or federal, uh, at the municipal level, we're the grassroots. So we see it. Yeah. Do you get a sense and, that when people actually do approach you and do actually want to engage with you on those quote unquote hot topic issues, are they talking to you about municipal issues only? Because you know, as a counselor, you have a jurisdictional role to play. You don't deal with right. you. You have you. You can advocate on issues around health and education, but it is not something you can fix as a municipal leader. When people come to you, you are the closest to them. So, do you get a sense that they know that? If it's an education issue, they go talk to their MLA. If it's a uh, health issue, they go talk to their MLA. If it's a pothole issue, yes, they can talk to me. If it's a passport issue, they have to go talk to their MP. Or are they coming to you with a range of issues and they want you to solve it as the closest to them? Well, they come with a range of issues. And often, you know, even reaching out. So if they're not happy with the answers that they'll get with, you know, why isn't, why is the village doing this? We've had them where they called our MP over municipal issues, our MLA over municipal issues, but they also come to us as a municipal counselor with provincial and federal issues. And I blame that on our education system. You're, the, you're uh, not the, the, you're not the only right one counselor. Once they removed um, just that common sense education dealing with what politics and how your governments work, our generations become more and more blind to the levels and it just becomes blurred. And, you know, that's, uh, that's adding 
a bit of weight to municipal councillors and stress because as a municipal councillor, people are always complaining about, you know, we're going to say different provincial taxes. We don't control those, but they don't understand our, um, or how to direct it properly to get those answers and, and their complaints. I also plus, sit on the C, I also sit on a CA board. So I get to see the provincial side and the municipal side. So for those who don't know, a CA is a constituents association for a political party out here in Alberta. It might be different in different uh, jurisdictions, but that's what it is here in Alberta. Thank you for answering those. I want to turn to the village of Andrew as a whole now, and I want to talk about some of the challenges and accomplishments that the village is going through. But before I do that, I'm going to preface this line of questioning. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. Now, it might line up with what's going on at council, but at the end of the day, it's still his opinion. With that being said, for those who are about to send nasty emails, please send them to me because I'm the one asking the questions and he is just answering the questions I ask. So there we go. With that being said, councillor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing the village of Andrew as of recording this in the middle of October 2024? Well, it's challenges. Um we don't have a single single challenge. We have multiple challenges. So one of the challenges we're facing right now is the revitalization of our school as a charter school. Um, again, a couple of years ago now, it started in the process and Elk Island did close the local school due to lack of attendance and other issues. So the village actually purchased the school building from Elk Island because the building houses the rec center, the library, our public archives, the municipal offices, and of course the school. So that is one challenge. Uh, economic development is another challenge for us. So being in the northeastern part of Lamont County, we're right away from everybody else. Now our, regionally, it's very agricultural base, but we're just off of Highway 44. So we're trying to capitalize on having access to that trade port or that route. So that is a challenge there. It's getting businesses and individuals to come out to Andrew and say, this is a good spot to invest. The other issue is getting our stuff up to date. So in my opinion, and I'm going to express this in my opinion, Andrew has been like an old car that we found in the garage. It hasn't really been started up and revitalized for a few years. So now we're working on it that way. We have older buildings. We have smaller tax base. We have that aging population that is aging in place, which is great. However, with all these factors, it doesn't make it attractive to younger families to move here to start that revitalization. We'll have a generation rollover. Um, you know, we're dealing with boomers. We're dealing with millennials. We're dealing with Generation X, which I'm one of that group. We all have different thoughts of what we want from our community and how we want it to go. So that is a big challenge there, balancing the demands of, of each generation. So that's one of the challenges right now that we're facing. And the other challenge is just getting people that move to the community engaged in the community. So I want to go back to a few of these topics and I want to dive into them if you don't mind. I want to, <laughs> that, that's my job, right? That's my job yeah. to learn a little bit more. I want to talk about a more macro issue because I think a lot of these challenges fall under the macro issue of the infrastructure challenges that the village is facing. Well, you're, you're trying to set up a charter school. You have aging uh, community and you have a tax base that 
is relatively small in the grand scheme of things. How does the village move forward knowing that you can't tax your way out of addressing these issues and you have to do it with the help of partners, whether it be businesses, whether it be volunteerism, whether it be the province, whether it be the federal government, how do you feel, how do you, how do you start addressing some of these issues? So that way in five years time, when I come talk to you again, you're not talking about these exact same issues and some of these will be marked off. What do you see as the path forward for the village? Because, and I hate to use the A word because I know I'm going to get yet someone yelling at me from a certain organization that hates it when I talk about it. But if you don't solve these issues, dissolution has to be a pr possibility because smaller municipalities like the village won't be able to address some of these infrastructure challenges without doing it on the backs of the ta tax base. You're bang on. That's the, the whole word, that D word, dissolution, where, you know, this is an issue that all villages have to deal with. And I've actually was reading a, a paper from the University of Calgary, uh, from public, School of Public Policy. And Alberta is unique in the sense that we've chosen to keep our villages, keep our smaller communities, not follow the path of like Manitoba a few years ago. You know, every community under a thousand, they just literally done away with. You're going to amalgamate. For Andrew, it's going to be one of these things. We're holding one little stick. You would either work with us or look after us because yeah. it, that's that's the two choices. For having um, collaborative agreements in place and working with the county, to with the provincial government, and with the federal government, you know. All three come into play. So grant funding being in place, the we'll talk about the LGF. Okay. That is one that I have not met one rural counselor in small towns and villages that says, hey, we're happy, 100 percent happy with this. We understand the structural change and why, but we want it to be a little more favorable in its balance. Um it really does kind of feel at times that it's leaning towards the larger urban centers. The other thing that comes in unique with this here, and we talk about dealing with counties. So us as a village are a member of AB Muni is having that balance between the two. So dealing with the AB Muni and RMA, when you actually get us counselors together, we find we have much more in common with our rural counterparts than say, um, Edmonton, you know, and I'm going to throw this out there and I'm probably going to get the stink eye for it. So I'm going to use an example. The city of Edmonton spent $100 million for bike lanes. That budget that they spent on bike lanes would run my village for 75 years. That's huge. Um, and, you know, the mayor's doing it. I will say Mayor Soji's done a good job in keeping and advocating for a city, but there has to be that balance. And I'm not seeing it with the LGFF. I'm not seeing it within other programs that will work towards smaller municipalities under 2,500. You know, the village of Andrews under 500, population's under 500. We're just over the 400 mark now, again. We're looking at one infrastructure project that potentially is just replacing a sewer line but it's going to cost us $752 million or it's the preliminary estimates. We have 217 houses in our village. We have uh, about 400 parcels of property. That becomes a really big potential cost on us as residents. We're not alone when we look at all our other neighboring villages. These costs are not being balanced out. Um, okay, there's a few things that I want to talk about, and this I find this fascinating already, and I, I, I appreciate you being candor about this. What does the village of Andrew need to do today 
to attract new businesses because I know the village is part of the Alberta hub, which is a Northern Northeast economic uh, development uh, initiative put on from uh, Lamont County all the way to uh, Lloyd Minster and all the way up to Athabasca. What sectors, what industries, what are you looking for to attract that economic driver to the community so you can help start addressing some of these issues and start, quote unquote, revitalizing part of your community so that way, again, you're not doing it on the backs of the people who are there? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. So the other day I had a talk with uh, with our Rita, Bob Espalco, who's the executive for the Alberta Hub. So is Andrew going to draw in a new manufacturing plant, you know, to produce batteries? No. Andrew can actually offer, and we have small industrial areas for the support services. Where we're close, this close to the heartland and development within the Fort Saskatchewan and Sturgeon County, all that area here, we're only 35 minutes from Andrew to Northwest Refinery, NWR. 40 minutes here in Fort Sask. So I see our chances of developing more for housing, residential, and for the support services. So maybe your contract welder or contract pipe fitter. You know, Andrew could be a great community for you to set up shop. And it's not that far away from the heartland to get in there and do those contracts and do those jobs. We've looked at bringing in... Um, in the past, we looked at bringing in a couple of consultants. Um, what can we do for our village and how to develop an economic plan for it? We're currently working on that and updating our strategic plan, which will reflect more of our current situation and our abilities to adapt to it. The arena do you, has been do, very do you have buy-in? Sorry, do you have buy-in from the community? Because council is only one part of this issue, right? And I say issue as an issue as in trying to solve this issue. But if you don't have buy-in from the community, you are not going to get anywhere. And if you, as a council, want something done, you have to get the residents of the village of Andrew to address uh, to be behind it, because there are. Probably, and I say this knowing that it is a fact because every community has them. These smaller urban communities like the village, some people don't want to see it change. They are comfortable with the way the community is. So how do you get the buy-in from the community knowing that any investment might mean that is going to change the reason why people either have moved or have stayed in the village of Andrew? Well, that's another one that comes down to, frankly, dollars and cents. Uh, and when we start looking at our infrastructure projects, and uh, you know, we're gonna take you get a bill for a hundred dollars for the restaurant. You split it with ten people, it's ten dollars. You split it with two, it's fifty bucks. The less change and less people we have in the village, the more expensive it becomes per individual, and it becomes a necessity. You just can't say we're not having sewer lines anymore. It doesn't work. And you have to really put it to the people. This is the cost. This is the actual cost of uh, inflation. Um, and that sometimes becomes an interesting conversation with individuals. A lot of our residents are, um, that are seniors are on fixed income. You know, that is So a, a $50 a year increase is a big issue to them. Yes. Heck, but they don't want to see that field of that, it... that area suddenly these old houses torn down or this building removed and oh my god you're going to put in a new business from an outsider uh who are they is it going to be noisy is it going to be loud um and we've gone through these questions but they have to realize and that taking the time to communicate it the benefits of this so you so with our village you know, getting the school back is going to be huge for me, keeping that change moving forward. Losing the school was actually a real big wake up call for a lot of our residents because they never thought they would ever lose a school. The first school built in Andrew was in 1906. So 
when you have that institution in your community for that long and then it goes away, that was a really large wake up call. And as a result, you know, one of our, our assessment on the village dropped by $1.6 million. You know, even though really? we've been selling houses, yes. You, you can buy a house in Andrew for $200,000 at anywhere else would probably run you three fifty four hundred. You know, it's, so that is a wake up call and has been for a lot of our residents. We have to keep, start moving forward staying as this quiet little sleepy village which it has been and and very known but unknown so you know it's been known okay. by people who's come through here and played ball and hockey here 20 30 years ago but if you ask anybody who's been here in the last 10 years and that number is a lot smaller when it comes to development right now um the biggest exchange for it has been dealing with new people buying properties. So in 2021, our total uh, land value exchange or sales were in the village of 1.9 million. Oh. 2023, it hit almost 2.9 million. Wow. So we've seen a large uptick. And we've also seen a, a lot more new residents. So it's uh, in the last couple of years that's moved in and sit very quietly at home, not involved. Um, so, so hopefully they do get still involved. keeping that sleepy, quiet feel, but, uh, you know, it's not. No, understandable. Um, I don't want to uh, uh, let this be sounding like it's a, everything is bad in the village of Andrew because it is not. There are some good things that go on in the village of Andrew, and I want to make sure I get this on the record because I don't want people to going away saying, why would I ever go to the village of Andrew? From your perspective, what are the accomplishments that you are proud of when it comes to the village of Andrew? Well, knowing that you've only been on council for three years, but what are, the, what are the accomplishments or even the highlights of your community that you look at and say, you know what, we do have our issues, but we have this going for us? We have really good community groups here. Uh, they're small, but they're really active. You know, so our Garlic Fest. So this year, Garlic Fest. Yeah, oh, okay. Look you, on your face. Yeah, yeah, for, those, <laughs> for those who are not watching this right now and only listening to this via audio, um, my ears just perked up because he's about to explain something that I did not know about. And I'm trying to look on my notepad and see if I can find a space to write down what you're about to say. What the heck is Garlic Fest? Garlic Fest has been, that's been going on in the village, Andrew, for just over 20, 25 years. Um, it is a, it's a hub of activity for us. And it just went by two weeks ago. So it's in the fall. It has the Egg Society involved with it. The ACCA, the Andrew Community Centers, they're involved with it. The Rainbow Club, which is our seniors club, they're involved with it. Our local Lions Club is involved with it. And the Village Council is involved with it. Uh -huh. So it is a real community-based event. And this year, I believe the numbers for visitors top 2,000. Which is which is great. I'm uh, gonna ask the dumb ignorant. Awesome. I'm gonna ask the dumb ignorant question right now here, Merwin. But I'm assuming garlic is involved with the garlic festival, right? Like this is not just a pseudonym of a name that used to be about garlic, but now it is about something completely different. No, it is about garlic. We have vendors that sell garlic. We have different garlic products. Um, so we have a market. I think the market this year was close to 100 people uh, setting up with their different businesses and services. It filled the arena or the, the ACCA and, uh, curling arena and outside and involved, you know, with pony rides for kids, jump houses, play things. But yes, with the garlic and we have guest speakers that talk about garlic, whether it's how to grow it, how to store it, how to cook it. Um, 
and a dinner and dance garlic themed. If you want garlic fries, we have curly garlic fries. You want roasted garlic, we have that. And then you come for the dinner and we have a great Ukrainian dinner with garlic. Lots of garlic. Is okay, there. so I'm gonna find out when 2025 is because I need to go there. I need to go there because this sounds fantastic. As someone who loves garlic as much as I do, I need to be there to experience the garlic festival of 2025. You come for it. I will be your personal tour guide <laughs> to get you into all the right spots, but all the hot spots I of the garlic festival and Andrew. <laughs> Yes, it's awesome. So this, this is a very good positive thing for our community. We have the Memorial Hockey Tournament. That's been going on for, I believe, 35, 40 years. It's, it's long before my time here in the village. But, you know, that's coming up in March. <laughs> this brings in hockey players, multi-generational hockey players. You know, I've met gentlemen who are in their 70s, that started playing hockey or remember coming to Andrew to play hockey. So it's a nice tournament and it draws in that multi-generational uh, events. So you have grandparents there with their grandkids watching their dad play or parents and grandparents watching, you know, their, the whole generation uh, is involved with hockey. We're seeing that grow every year in interest. And that's that's another great event we have here. So uh, we have a couple other smaller events. Andrew used to have sport off. So that's now in the summer we have a the ball tournament, softball tournament. And again, it's kept very small. I think we accommodate up to 12, 14 teams. We're gonna have two diamonds at this point, but it's every, everybody camps out at the ACCA grounds. So it becomes a real for the ball players um, and for the community coming in and watching it. So it's very almost like going to a family reunion. I, so that's I did, a positive feeling. Yeah, I did get that sense when I was up in Andrew earlier this summer and I was driving through and people were turning their heads because they probably didn't know who this guy was randomly taking photos of their community buildings and their school and their massive giant tourism ducks that they have in the downtown core. But it did get a sense because they were waving high and some people said hello. And some people just were going, Oh, what brings you here? So it seems like it is a family oriented community. Would you say that? Yes, it is. And it's, and it's been evolving a little more as more people move in and start getting notice. Okay, the garlic fest, and now we have more people coming in. Also, it's being noted, hey, this is a quiet little gem that's you know needs a little bit more polishing, but it is one of the gems of rural Alberta. Yeah. So, um, while we're on the topic of events and tourism. What are some of your favorite spots within the community? Is there anywhere that you can go and just decompress after a long day? And I'm going to kind of uh, make you say not your house, because I know every municipal leader loves to go to their house after a long day. But for you, where in the community can you go and just relax for a few day, a few hours or even an hour? Uh, within the community, I'm very fortunate. So um, several years ago, I actually bought a piece of property in Andrew um, with the idea of building on it. Um, that didn't happen. So we kind of use it as our rec property. So I have a fire pit on it, I have my garden, uh, greenhouse. So, and it's right in the middle of plain view of everybody. So I'm hidden in plain sight. Um, it's kind of one of those fun spots where we sit down there in the evenings, have a campfire. Sometimes I'll throw it on Facebook, you know, having a campfire or bonfire. BYOB, and it's open to the residents. And anybody who wants to come along, sit back. Um, we've got quite a collective group of musicians in the village. And, you know, sometimes somebody will show up with a guitar, and uh, it can be some, you know, midnight and the fire is still kicking along. But that's been my uh, kind of spot to get away from and, and go to. Uh, away from my house. Uh, um, it's I've interesting. I've introduced a new segment on this show, and I did not prepare you for this, but 
Um, as I said earlier on in the interview, we are less than a year away from the next municipal elections. And I like to know, I like to know from the horse's mouth in some sense, do you expect to put your name on the ballot? Do you want to run for re-election? Have you enjoyed your time as a municipal politician that you say in the year's time I'm going to re-offer or have you made your decision yet? You, along with many of the residents, have been asking this question. And and as I told right now, I'm about 80% sure that I'm not going to rerun. I do have some other irons in the fire uh, um, that I want to look after. So being a counselor for this last term, I've been in a semi-retired position where I could afford to put in a lot more time than if I, if I was working full time. So... 80% chance that I'm not going to run. There's still a 20% chance I will. Um, it doesn't mean that I won't stop doing things to promote and enhance the village. So in some ways, being on council ties your hands, um, but it does give you influence on the direction of things. So I'm going to leave it at that. You got an 80-20 um, the other thing that is being brought forward in our community uh, hasn't passed yet. So we have five councillors. We may be going to have an, an elected mayor. And this is in front of council now and everything's being weighed out. So if we go to an elected mayor, then you have four councillors. We'll see how that changes um, the political landscape and opportunities in Andrew. Well, we will have to continuously watch this. So before I let you go, I, I said uh, this was going to be a half hour to 40 minute conversation. We're almost at the hour mark now. So I have one final question for you and it's the million dollar question. And I want you to sum up for me why the village of Andrew is such a unique place to live to work, and to raise a family. Why is it so unique? We got a 30-foot duck. <laughs> it is a community that's evolved over time. And yeah, the duck actually is one of the big things that catch everybody's attention. So we, we have a very unique community. So this community originally, you know, has evolved over its last 100 years. This is what I believe the post office was established in 1902. So we're an older community. And it has that sense of heritage and that change that's come into it. And that's what makes it unique. Uh, the culture here is predominantly Ukrainian and Métis. That makes it, um, gives it another twist. So as our village has evolved over time, it's brought in unique characteristics and it's personality from its architecture to its food to um, just the overall environment. So if we're smaller for family looking for a place to live, it's quiet. We have a very low crime rate. You know, it's a kind of community during COVID. If it wasn't for the masks being worn at the grocery store and the gas station, we still watch kids ride their bike down the street. We've seen couples going for walks. Uh, we had set up a pitch and pot. Uh, that was free. You know, so it's not just a mini golf, but this was outside with a longer pitch and pot. Uh, a lot of people get out and do things without that super close contact. So That's we awesome. evolved very much into these kind of uh, just making it work that small town ingenuity that to keep that small town and that normalcy of life going. And that's, that's one of the nice features. And I think unique features about Andrew. Well, counselor, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your day to sit down with me and talk about the village of Andrew yourself. And now what is my most favorite festival in Alberta, which is the Garlic Festival, which I will be there because I'm a garlic fan. So I will uh, 
hold you to that offer for next year to to give me a tour, the 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 the, the, the be my chaperone, if you will, during the uh, garlic festival. But I truly appreciate you taking time to sit down and do this today. It's a pleasure to get to know you and get to know your community. And I know you said 80, 20% you're going to potentially not reoffer, but I hope that changes because I think the, the village of Andrew is better served with you at the council table. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me on here. And, and Chris, I said, you don't have to wait till garlic fest to come to Andrew. You can come up anytime you have my, uh, you have my attention. And at our council, we recognize you as a, for doing, you know, looking at the small communities. And I want to say thank you for taking the time to look at villages in our rural Alberta and talk to a small municipal elected officials. So thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Now, we hope you enjoyed today's conversation with one of Candace municipal leaders truly making a difference within their community. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode. Your support helps us to continue to bring you more important conversations like you heard today. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time here on Cross Border Interviews. Until then.